gear. So I'm just going to walk you through a couple of, well, lots of my favorite <laughs> items. Let's start with bags. This is my transit bag. It's a roller bag. It's very heavy. It's full of prime lenses, laptops, cameras, as you'll see in a second. And loading all of this onto my back oh, is not going to help me before I start shooting. So once you've rolled one of these bags through an airport, trust me, you won't go back to a backpack. Um, so it's lockable on the front. I'll open it up. Whole bunch of stuff on the inside. Batteries. You'll notice they're flipped around. I know straight away that they they need charging. A um, bunch of little tripod adapters here. Lens cloths. Tape just for fixing patch fixing stuff. In here, remote triggers, um, iPhone, Mophie charger, all important SSD. Um, laptop sits neatly inside. Walkie talkies, crucial on a shoot like this. Um, talking in between two cars, so I can direct my subject to reverse go forwards, you know, keep to speed when we're doing tracking shots, that sort of thing. More hard drives, more backup. Backup three times, you want it in three different places. Um, polarizing filter, useful for shooting through glass, reducing reflection. Um, these are sort of landscape filters, rarely used, but so I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> um, this is a cable bag. This just keeps all of my fly away things in check. It's a bit of a mess inside, but I like keeping it in a bag, so just chuck it in, chuck the bag, so there's not a mess in here. Keeps things neat and tidy. Ah, okay, cameras, let's start with cam let's roll on to cameras. I shoot pretty much everything with a Canon 5D Mark IV. I love this camera, and I shoot it with a battery adapter so I can shoot landscape and portrait really really easily. I couldn't shoot this camera without this anymore. It's big and heavy but just it's just more comfortable to use. It also stores two batteries in its in the holder so that keeps me going all day. I never really have to change a battery on the shoot. Lenses, that's a 50mm Sigma Art. This is a 24mm Canon. 35mm Canon, 85mm Sigma Art. Love this lens. Very, very sharp. It's actually sharper than the Zeiss lens and way, way cheaper. Big guns, 70-200, 2.8. Long reach, nice and fast, useful. Always have it in my bag. Uh, I also carry a film camera. On pretty much every shoot I go on, I like to shoot one roll of film. This is a have it I picked up off Rich Stapleton from Serial Magazine, I don't know if you know that mag, but I uh, picked that up off him on a shoot in California and it's just for personal. I like to keep shooting film, I think it keeps my hand in but also helps inform my gra grade at the end of the day. A lot of my work is film inspired so having an idea of like grain and colours is always useful. Okay, so that's my Transit bag. Oh, one more thing. Two more things. Uh, it's got a, like a passport pouch up here. So you can just easily access that when you're traveling. No digging around deep into a bag. And also this on the back is kind of fun and nifty. Good look. So what I tend to do is I use this to transport all my gear through the airport. And once I get to my hotel, or wherever I'm shooting, I'll lock the bag to a solid, unnickable object and then decant whatever I need to use into this. And this is my day bag, uh, Donkey F2, designed by Jim Donkey for use in the Vietnam War. Hasn't changed its design since the 70s. Very, very useful, easy access on a shoot. It flat packs. You can do it all that out. So I tend to pack that into my hold luggage, small footprint, 
And then when I get to my destination, take it out, rebuild it, and then just drop in all my lenses like this. So when I'm shooting, I have this on my shoulder, shoot like this, then I can, I don't even have to put my bag down. I can open it like this, rest the camera on here, and then change lenses as I'm going. Very, very fast, easy access, love it. This is a carabiner clip um, that I've stolen from my son, H. He suggested I take this actually on a shoot and I've never looked back since because this is in really, really useful when you're working on moving vehicles, boats, whatever. I tend to secure it, my bag, when I'm not using it, to a solid object. You know, I, driving in a car, going around a corner, it's very easy for your equipment to like slide about when it's secured to something. Bose, quiet comfort headphones, essential for traveling, sleeping, long planes, long plane rides. This is another thing that I always travel with. It's just a simple toolkit with a whole bunch of different screwdrivers, tools, just for fixing stuff on the road. I don't want to be like hunting around for a toolkit. And I can just put that in my case. It's made by iFixit. It's pretty really cheap, but useful. There's also another piece of equipment that I like to travel with, but he doesn't always get to come on trips. This is an H. He requires a bit of maintenance, but um, he's invaluable. On you, mate? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's pretty much it. So what is the story? It seems a good place to start, considering this is a storytelling workshop. But it's a puzzling question, because we all know what a story is, right? You've read them, you've watched them, you've listened to your friends tell you them. But have you ever considered what makes a good one? What keeps you turning the page, sat in that movie theater seat, and listening to your friends? And is there a method we can learn, or techniques that we can help, that can help improve our own? A relative of mine is a Hollywood scriptwriter. He's a very good one. You'll have seen some of his movies. And I love talking to him about the art of storytelling. He's got some great thoughts. But a basic premise that he always goes on about, and I agree with him, is that a story needs structure. As opposed to pure narrative, which is essentially a fairly neutral sequence of events. You know, I did this, then I did that, then I went here. He says a story and a good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end should tie up with a plot line or a question that is posed at the beginning or in the middle. This structure adds a level of satisfaction to the experience. And an ending, a well rounded, crafted ending, is a sort of like a payoff. It's satisfying for the viewer. To experience. So we've established it needs structure, but what else? A common flaw is saying too much when it comes to relaying any type of information. I mean, look at the internet today. You try and find something, you're searching for hours, wading through all their scump. So when it comes to a story, keep it simple. We're not making a movie here. We've got no music or verbal communication with photographs. So our plot line needs to be really simple. Don't overcomplicate matters. And when it comes to the edit, ensure every single image in your set relates to each other and reinforces your narrative. I like to create intrigue at the start of my stories, maybe cropping into an action that someone is doing before me. Once the audience interest is peaked, they'll dig deeper, they'll scroll down. They'll flick through your images to try and find out what's going on. But that first image is crucial, really key to bring them deeper into the story. Be mindful that the pictures you include should reinforce the story throughout. This is taking your role beyond a director and photographer into the editing world. Within movies, that's a separate profession in itself. But a friend once told me, who worked in movies, a good editor knows when to leave out an image. Even if it's your best image of the day, if it doesn't add to the story, if it doesn't 
work with the other images in your set, leave it out, save it for Instagram or something. So my takeaway is think beginning, middle, end. End to relate to something at the start or the middle. It should tie things up neatly. Leave your audience with a smile, satisfied feeling. A good story should communicate the best of what happened in an event. Focus on the best, support it with some details, but don't say too much. So where did you start? You need a plot, easy. It's like being back at school. For that, you need three main elements. One, location, two, character, three, event. If you're a wedding or documentary photographer, you already have those three things in place. You have the bride and groom, you have the church, and you have the wedding, obviously. But if you're shooting lifestyle or brand photography, you're gonna need to do a little more legwork to get those things aligned, to put them in place. You're gonna need to do some work thinking about the event. The magic lies in what happens when those three elements collide when they interact. So it's worth considering each one as players in their own right. So let's look at location first. This is your stage. This is where the action is going to happen and the interaction between your characters or character and location is going to happen. So it's super, super important to get this right. The location gives you an opportunity to embellish the story. It also gives your story context. Wrecking your locations is also very important ahead of shoot day. Arriving before the light is right, assessing your angles. In our case, I intend to take our car, our Land Rover, to the cliffs where we're going to be shooting so I can see at what angle the sun is going to be hitting it and therefore which position I need to be in. Preparing is crucial. If you think in terms of your audience versus you, you're on the ground experiencing everything. You're walking along the beach, you're feeling the sand between your toes, you're hearing the waves crash. Your audience doesn't have the opportunity to feel this. So bring those elements into your photo set, into your story, so that they can feel what you're feeling. Capture that big, epic landscape image. It's really important. It's like your culmination scene. But don't forget the other pieces to the puzzle, the details that make it up. Leave the epic behind for a minute and get into it. Photograph trees, leaves, sand, furniture if you're inside, signposts if you're in a street. All of these things are clues that will orientate your audience, or you can use them to send your audience into different directions when it comes to the edit. If you're working lifestyle, brand, as I mentioned earlier, pour effort into establishing your scenes. Don't overlook props. Ensure they're right for your story and right for your client if you're working for someone. So for example, on this shoot, we're working for a vintage Land Rover company. The company name is Cool and Vintage, but they do make modern builds of old cars. The first model they offered me was a new build or refurbished Land Rover. It was mint, it was beautiful, it was amazing. But the name Cool and Vintage spoke to me in a different way. I wanted something old, I wanted something that had some history and story itself. So I chose the totally battered Series 1 and a Series 3 as a backup vehicle. It felt more appropriate to the story I want to tell and more appropriate to the company name, Cool and Vintage. Likewise with any supporting props. So uh, we could have had like modern surfboards attached to the top of our truck, but mm, it wouldn't feel right. So the surfer that we're using in this shoot, and I'll come on to him in a second when we talk about character, but the surfboards that he crafts are classic 
longboards. They date from the same era as our Land Rover. It all helps to reinforce the story. For example, in this shoot, we're working with a vintage Land Rover. Um, um, I have an idea for an image of our character using a camera to take pictures of the truck. But I don't really want to be, I, I don't want him to be using like a, a, an iPhone or a, a modern camera. It doesn't quite feel right. So I brought with me an old Hasselblad. I might not use it, but it's there and it suits the era of the vehicle. It looks beautiful, but more importantly, it reinforces the vehicle. It reinforces the story and enriches the narrative. So my takeaway is the location should contribute as much as the character. Focus on the details and bring your audience along for the ride. Number two, character. You need a character or characters to photograph. Casting can be a fairly lengthy process in the commercial world of photography, but I don't really want to dig too deep into the sort of aesthetic aspect of this. I'm more interested in relaying how you can use characters to craft events in your story. That might sound strange, but a good way to drive events within your story is to start with their desires. What do they want to do? How do they approach their life? What, are they, what is their ultimate goal? So desire is at the heart of everything we do, and identifying that uh, in your character and relaying it to your audience is a great way to connect with them emotionally. So it's kind of fun too, identifying uh, what our character wants. We can start to craft or introduce obstacles in the way of them reaching it. So setbacks or reversals in fortune, these are ultimately events. You know, uh, someone relaying to you a disaster story is really interesting. If someone's day has gone perfectly, not much has happened. There's no event. So when you're creating a fictional story, you can go off in all sorts of tangents in terms of obstacles to them reaching that ultimate goal. For this example, I figured, I'm thinking to myself, how can I, how can I involve a character that relates to my client, but also my location? Surfing is massive in Portugal, and it's a beautiful coastline. When we were casting for this shoot, we had a few options. We were looking at like maybe a surfer from Wales. I was thinking about bringing someone over, but in the end, we found someone in Portugal. This seemed to make much more sense. They knew the environment and they would interact with it more comfortably than me bringing in a foreigner just because he was a surfer. Similarly with the age of my character. This is a shoot for cool and vintage. I didn't want, the obvious choice is a 20 year old buff surfer who looks amazing, but that's kind of cliched. I wanted to use someone a touch more vintage. So after a bit of digging, we found a mid-40s board shaper, super famous within the surfing industry, real, a real gem of a person to work with. He knew the industry inside out, and he knows this location inside out. So I can look to him to help craft my story. I can also use his board shaping profession as something to bounce off. He's going to be super comfortable in his board shaping room. I can set him loose doing what he does best and I can follow him around the room shooting all the processes that are involved with creating a surfboard. The fact Dan is in his mid-40s also adds a bit of credibility so he has more, he has more lifelines in his face. He's actually also a more comfortable person to work with. He's, he's a mature dude, he's comfortable within himself and he's super comfortable in his boardroom and also on the beach. So I won't have to direct him too much. I can kind of let him loose, tell him to do what he does best, and then I can react to anything that I see might create a good photograph. I don't want the person that I'm working with to be constantly looking at me for direction. Going, oh, I don't really know where to put myself, you know? I'm gonna get unnatural images off the back of that. So working with a real person doing their real job or their real hobby, will give you a more natural image. We have our location and we have our character. That brings me neatly onto events. What's going to happen? I like to use what I call the desire and obstacle rule. So you've established the desire in your character. 
let's introduce some obstacles. If we take this shoot as our example, what is a surfer's ultimate desire? It's finding the perfect wave, right? That perfect right-hander peeling across a beach between two rocks, something like that. That's our end scene, our end goal. You could think of that as your end image. That's, what you were, that's where you want to end your story. So tracking backwards, what can we introduce that might prevent him or her from achieving that? So I have an end scene in my mind, an end image, you know, uh, I'll try and describe it to you. Golden sunset and a feeling of space, escapism, relaxation, something like that. What obstacles can I put in the way of my surfer that can prevent him or her from achieving that goal? We could go off in all sorts of tangents here. Um, there are a multitude of plot lines that we could introduce, but we're not making a movie. We have no verbal uh, clues, and we only have three days to shoot, so I don't want to get crazy complicated on that front. It's actually quite important when you're just dealing with stills not to get too bogged down in complex plot lines because it's very easy to get lost or one's audience to get lost. A little bit of research before I got here into board shaping showed me that it's actually quite an mm, industrial process. It's noisy and dusty and all happens inside, so it's artificially lit. That scenario contrasts completely with my end scene. So I've got a great starting point, inside, dimly lit or harshly lit environment, already an obstacle to that feeling of escapism at the end. So this surfer has to go through this process to get here, well, that's that's kind of way. There's a journey already starting. I'm already crafting a journey from beginning to end. I also need to keep in mind my client, my ultimate client, which is Cool and Vintage, the Land Rover company. How can I incorporate their product, the Land Rover, into the story as well? And can I introduce an obstacle that we can overcome using the Land Rover? Because that really reinforces the value of that product. Again, let's keep it simple. Searching for the perfect spot is going to take time. You know, this is a place that's deserted. There's you know, crowds of people learning to surf on their surfboard. This is like the ultimate spot. So I'm thinking like, you know, traveling up and down, wind-blown coast, axle grinding, bumpy roads, something like that. The Land Rover is the enabler of the desire. He's got to overcome obstacles, he's got to travel down inaccessible roads in order to reach his desire and the Land Rover can help him do that. These are going to be really beautiful scenes. I'm a massive Land Rover fan myself. I have one of these vehicles at home if you follow me on Instagram or you follow my Land Rover actually has an Instagram account. I mentioned them, Hector the Rover, go check him out. It's a Series 3 Land Rover. So this, this, is, this is a story that means something to me and I think that's really important. Involve yourself in your plotting or introduce something that you're really interested in because I think that will, that, will, that will come across in the pictures that you're making. If you love something then you're going to pour time and energy into it and that will come across in the end product. We can also introduce some vague uncertainty or danger, thinking maybe cutting away to a big brooding ocean, maybe close-ups of the sea, something that feels a little off, and that sort of unsettling nature will make a viewer sit up in anticipation that something might go wrong. Keep your audience in tune by adding a layer of suspense. For example, that wave shot that I'm talking about, that will make my audience concerned that something might go wrong. Even if it doesn't actually happen, it's, it's keeping them in check, keeping them in tune. Photography is a medium. I think what I love about photography over other mediums is the fact that the whole story isn't relayed. Something is always left to the viewer's imagination. You could liken it to uh, a movie versus a book. I love both. I love movies. But I also love reading. 
And I'm often disappointed if I watch a movie after I've read a, the, the same book. Because the book allows me to imagine my own image. I can get deeper into the narrative. The movie is one director's representation, his, his take on the narrative. I feel the same way about photographs. I feel telling a story using a series of still images leaves gaps in the narrative that my viewers can fill. So when creating a story, I'll think in like major scenes. I might think, right, I've got to start here, I've got to capture this scene, and this is where I'm going to end up. And then I just fill in the dots leading my viewer through. I don't reveal everything in the way a film might. There's always something left unanswered with a still image. There's no verbal communication. There's no sound adding atmosphere. I need to generate these feelings through the still images alone. That mood might come from lighting or maybe a close-up on my character's face or hands. Something visceral. Uh, relaying emotions in photographs, I think you need to use uh, close-ups of your characters, like close-ups of eyes or hands, capturing processes. I like to think of my work like pieces to a puzzle. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. I'll, 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 I'll lay out the sort of basis, but I won't include all of the pieces so that the audience can at their own interpretation, their own experiences will feed into the story. So we've established a good story can flow from a combination of character and events and location. But how do we relay that story using images as opposed to words? Your choice of shot is absolutely key, as important as the words used in a book. In the same way that a book written with three words is going to be fairly boring. A photo essay composed of the same types of photograph is going to tire quickly too. A variety of angles and compositions is going to draw your viewer in and connect them into your story in a more engaging way. Let's run through some of the key shot types I like to use and the qualities each one can bring to your story. An extreme long shot is used to show a subject from a distance or an area within which a scene is taking place. It's a study in scale, majesty, they're big, grand images. You've all seen them on Instagram, right? That lone climber isolated against a massive drift of snow, a uh, canoeist paddling across a huge lake. They're excellent for establishing or revealing a scene. Instagram is a one-shot platform, so this sort of image engages particularly well on there. You can immediately comprehend the scene, you can immediately understand what's going on, you don't actually need a caption to understand. I tend to use a telephoto lens to shoot these images, they help to compress distance, so they bring background elements closer to the foreground. So there's more of a relationship between my subject and the environment that they're operating in. For storytelling purposes, I love to use this image at the end of a set. It's a, it's a lovely, satisfying finish. Your audience has worked through the story, they've followed your character all the way through, and they come to the end scene. It's like the end scene in a movie. You can Go away if you're satisfied. My lens choice for this lens is either an 85mm prime or a 7200 telephoto zoom. Both will compress distance, both will relay the feeling you're after. In long shot, this shows your subject from top to bottom. The character is more of a focus than the extreme long shot, but the scenery still dominates. They're set within it, but you're moving in closer. 24mm lens for this shot is my go-to. 
depth perception is exaggerated using a wide angle lens such as this. It makes objects in the background feel a little bit further away than they might be in reality. This creates a feeling of space and distance between your subject in the foreground and something in the background. The distance of your camera from your subject can help create emotional distance between your subject and your audience. This generates a feeling of intrigue. Um, it, audience, the audience's interest is peaked and they want to find out a little bit more. What's going on here? That's the ultimate goal for this sort of image when I'm using it in storytelling. A medium shot typically frames someone from the waist up. It focuses on the character or characters in a scene while still including some of the surrounding environment. Try to frame your subjects without cutting through joints, through your waist or your knee or elbow. Since we're now moving in closer to our subjects, we want to be using something like a 35mm lens with some more natural perspective. Don't be tempted to go for a 24 because as you move in closer, you're going to start to distort faces, distort limbs, even though you'll still get that surrounding environment, it's not going to give you a natural image as you move in closer to your subject. A 35mm lens is a classic focal length, very close to the human eye. It will bring a realistic vantage point for your viewer and lead to a more natural looking image. Whereas medium and long shots deliver facts and orientate your audience, a medium close-up reveals emotions. This is a key goal when storytelling, so it's a key shot to make. The close-up shots reveal emotions or details relating to your subject and can tune your audience into your story. These images are rarely made with wide-angle lenses due to distortion. You're close up to your subject here. So I reach for my Desert Island lens, a 50 millimeter. This lens has a fantastic depth of field and will deliver you natural looking portraits, regardless of what distance you are from your subject. It's actually more difficult to tell a whole story if you focus on medium close-ups. There's no supporting information. You need other images to tell a full story. And I think this is one of the reasons why these sorts of images don't work so well on Instagram. It's, it's hard for the audience to gain an understanding of what's going on without supporting imagery or indeed a caption. A close-up camera shot tightly frames a subject or element within your scene so they become, that becomes the primary focus. Use it to keep your audience in tune and connected with your story. Concentrating solely on medium and long shots can quickly become boring. Uh, you run the risk of your audience becoming disconnected from the story. They may be enjoying the images themselves, but you can lose their interest in the message you're wanting to relay. So using close-ups can capture attention and keep your audience in tune with your subjects and in tune with what they're doing, the processes that are going on in the story. We're moving back into the realm of telephoto lenses here, but I would still suggest a 50 millimeter, provided you're happy getting up close to your subjects. Cutaways. A cutaway is a shot of something related to, but outside the main action of a scene. Even if a cutaway doesn't reveal anything new, it's super important for easing transitions between your main scenes. They are also perfect for introducing a vague sense of danger or uncertainty into your story. It's so easy to forget to shoot this type of image, especially in this world of Instagram bangers. But for telling a more rounded story using a series of images, this type of shot is invaluable. I can often be heard repeating to myself, details, 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 whilst I'm on location. 
it's very easy to forget to shoot them, but I can't stress it enough. If you want to tell stories with images, you need cutaways. My lens choice for this type of image is a 50 millimeter, very close to the human eye, perfect for picking out details and delivering a natural looking image. So to recap, number one, build a plot device before your shoot day. Number two, think of your location and your character and craft events out of obstacles associated with your character's desires. Number three, create a satisfying ending by allowing your character to overcome those obstacles and ultimately achieve their goal. So by following these simple rules, you can start to structure your narrative and create a story out of it. From that, you can start to build a shot list and work way more efficiently when it comes to shoot day. So now you have a plan, so go out and do it yourself. You receive an email from a client or prospective client. You know the sort of thing, we love your work, we find your Instagram feed, we love it. This image in particular we're really into, can you create something for us using our product? How do you start? I'm gonna walk you through all the steps I take. Things like, how do I identify locations? How do I build story around product? How I work with mood boards? so that I can get on the same page with my client, managing their expectations as well as my own, and also producing call sheets so that everyone involved with the shoot, once it's hopefully been commissioned, are on the same page too. Everyone knows where they need to be at the right time, and how do you remove any risk from your shoot by preparing beforehand? Asking the right questions. Okay, you receive an email, from a prospective client. You know the sort of thing. We came across your Instagram account, we love your work, would you be interested in collaborating with us? How do you move on from there? What questions do you ask to move that email into a proper sheet? Always respond positively. Thanks for your email, love to hear more. Really excited about the prospect of working with you. Then you need to ask them questions, drill down on their expectations. So I have a set number of bullet points that I'll bounce back to them. So I'm like, thanks very much. Um, do you have a project brief you can share? Sometimes prospective clients already have a brief sorted so you can cut out a lot of work by asking for that. If not, I ask them to fill out a number of bullet points as best they can so I can get more of an idea of their project and the requirements. Number one, I ask for creative specifications. That might be mood boards, any Im example imagery that they can give me so I can get on the same page as them. Particular subjects, what am I shooting? Is it a product? Is it a location? I may have addressed this in the opening line, but I still like to put this first one in there so we have it written in writing. Number two, shoot dates and the timeline for deliverables really really key because if this campaign needs to be delivered in the fall I can use fall colors the trees are going to look amazing if it's going to be delivered in midwinter and it's a, a beach shoot that's going to be tricky I'm going to have to fly to a different location to get those sunny scenes I can't shoot that in my backyard in Wales very gray in the middle of the winter number three desired regions and locations. They may already have some thoughts on this in mind. Good to get them thinking about it and manage expectations from the off. Number four, ask for a shot list or at least a number of deliverables. I need to know what they want from me from the outset. Number five, any social media asks. This will have ramifications on cost, but it will also have ramifications on how I approach the job. If I'm putting images on my Instagram account, I need to create imagery that's gonna sit well with the rest of my content. I'm not gonna put anything on my Instagram account because I'm aware you guys all follow me for a reason. I'm not gonna just advertise stuff to you because I'm getting paid loads of money. It needs to sit right for us all, right? So number six, I'll ask for the full usage terms and also usage period. So this is how are the images going to be used? Are they going to be used on a billboard campaign? Are they going to be used on my on uh, client's social media account? Are they going to be used on TV ads? 
all of these questions will help me start to price the job because if it's going to go on a billboard, it's going to be ka -ching. It's going to be a little small mag magazine advert. It's going to be a bit lower down. But all of this will help me start to produce the shoot and um, work out how much everything's going to cost. You should also ask about use of likeness in this uh, question because increasingly I'm being asked to feature in BTS videos or even campaigns where I'm actually shooting a campaign for a brand and they're, they're, they're using my profile to advertise their product. That has a value. Don't let that slide. Also worth raising any competitor brands or exclusivity terms. What I mean by that is if a car company approaches you to shoot a campaign, they may have a line in their contract that says you can't work for any other car brand for a set period of time after you deliver those shots. That's really, really key because if the campaign isn't worth much money and you agree to it, but then a Lamborghini campaign comes up and that's worth a huge amount of money and you can't take it because you're signed into some exclusivity deal, you're going to kick yourself. Check the small print. Finally, I ask for budget parameters. It's really good to have some sort of ballpark figure. Um, it's a bit like um, going to a builder and asking how much it costs to build a house. What do they want? You know, the builder's going to say, what do you want? Do you want a lot of glass? Do you want it built out of straw? Oh, all these questions are exactly the same as asking a client what they want from their shoe. So by receiving answers to all these questions, you can start building out that project brief for your client. You can start doing the legwork for them. They'll take you more seriously. And hopefully this is going to transition into a commission job. I use three criteria to help me start identifying locations. and. Number one is budget parameters. If there's no budget to get me halfway around the world, that's going to cut down my options slightly. Number two, timeline for deliverables. What is the time scale associated with this shoot? If I need to shoot next week, chewing up a bunch of time in travel is going to affect me delivering on time. And number three is creative specs or creative specifications. How are the images going to be used? They're going to be used on social, they're going to be used on print, whatever. Um, determining this plus the other two factors will help you begin the process of researching locations. For example, I received an email yesterday from a prospective client interested in an iceberg picture I'd shot in Canada about three years ago and they'd like me to shoot something similar for them. They state that they have no preference for location, but they do suggest Argentina. And my initial reaction is, great, I've never been to Argentina. Um, I'm about ready to dive in and start researching locations. But tipping back to those earlier points, do I know their budget? Have they got the budget to fly me to Argentina? Let's establish those ground rules before we dive into location research. If they haven't the budget to fly me to Argentina, can I shoot this campaign closer to home? I've been to Iceland before. I know there are icebergs there. I know I can get up close to them in a rib at Jokosal and Iceland Lagoon. Maybe this would be a better option, more cost-effective option. Tipping back to the third criteria, creative specs, how do they intend to use this image? If it's simply a close-up of an iceberg, the fissures running through the ice, I can shoot this anywhere, which means Iceland is a really safe bet for me. Another example is a shoot I did for Land Rover. They introduced their new Land Rover Discovery Sport, came to me, they had a good budget. I could have flown anywhere to shoot this campaign, but I really wanted to keep story at the heart of that project. Land Rover began life in North Wales. It was sketched the first design was sketched into the sand by Morris Wilkes, shown to his brother just after the war. I suggested to Land Rover HQ that I shoot a road trip story traveling from my hometown in Wales all the way through the mountains, ending up on that same beach. So there's a really nice story at the heart of that project. Location doesn't just come down to budget for my projects. 
I like to think about my client and help their backstory, if they have one, inform my shoot. And location is part and parcel of that. So what I'm trying to say is don't get bogged down with fancy exotic locations that you see on Instagram. It doesn't always have to run this way. Even if there's a big budget behind a campaign, I don't always travel to the other side of the world to shoot it. With the Land Rover example, I'm shooting on my back door. Keep story at the heart of everything you do. Okay, all's going well. We've agreed budget parameters. We've agreed creative specs. We've identified our locations. Where do we go from there? My next step is to create mood boards or a, or a treatment. I'm, I want to shift away from the email language and I want to get into visuals. I'm much better talking in pictures than I am with words. So developing a treatment deck is a really good first step to getting on the same page, to getting your client on the same page as you are. Sometimes I'll ask my client for a mood board themselves just to inform my treatment it's, it's worth an ask. They may have something already developed. They may have some example imagery that you can use to inform your treatment. I'm gonna walk you through an example treatment that I might send to a client, and within that will be an example mood board. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through an example treatment that I created for this cool and vintage shoot. This document goes to my client before they've actually commissioned me. This is, you could call it a pitch deck in a sense. It's a treatment, it's, it will show the client how I approach my photography and also how I will approach their brief. So it always opens with, I'm gonna just expand this, always opens with a title slide. So that's my logo, pretty clear who I am and what I do. Second page is a picture of myself and uh, a brief introduction about me and why I'm interested in this campaign. It's just a personal note, you don't have to include this, but I quite like it, it sort of personalizes the treatment. Second page is my approach. So this details things like how I would scout locations ahead of my shoot, um, how I would work with models, especially if they're not professional, how working quickly on set to keep things looking natural might be important. It also references my thinking regards looking for leading lines within the landscape, creating third dimension, drawing viewers into the scene. I also touch on color grading and retouching within these paragraphs. Um, talk about establishing color tones and managing client expectations from the outset. I, will, I finish up here saying my aim throughout is to ensure we end up with a cohesive set of campaign images that resonate with the target audience, eliciting emotional response from the viewer. That's at the heart of most of my work. Um, then I go straight into a mood board. So this is example imagery that I have pulled off the internet that I think may suit our campaign. I'm going to jump out of this PDF now and just show you a couple of websites that I use to find that imagery. This first one is called Design Inspiration. It's really, really old. I've been using it for many years back when I was a graphic designer. It basically is a hub for creativity and a tool for collecting and sharing ideas, much like a search engine, but it's a sort of curated Google images. So I'd bang in here some search terms, vintage Land Rover. It's going to throw up a whole host of search results, you know, I like the look of this, I like this colour, I like some of these old shots, this will just, all of this is inspirational material, similarly with vintage surf ads, surf posters, this will give me ideas for compositions, it will also give me ideas in colour palettes. I'll also use Pinterest, wealth of stuff on here. It's easy to overlook Pinterest, but it's actually a really great way to search visually. It's got a big user base, so there's lots of imagery on there. And also, a good old Google Images. So what I then do is pull these images 
into my treatment and just build out a mood board. So this just gives my client a good idea of where I'm going to go with the shoot. Good, a good mix of angles, good mix of transitional images, reveals, details, lighting, concepts. Also, as you can see down here with this surfer guy, I love this light leaking effect. And I might use that as a retouching reference for the shoot. Remember, this is a cool and vintage vibe. I really want to tip this into a sort of Polaroid, old school kind of look. So moving on from that, I'll also use the aforementioned websites to build out my color grade. And for this shoot, I've been looking at old Land Rover adverts, old surfing adverts. So in a similar fashion, I'll build out a mood board for the color grade. And then within Photoshop, I use this nifty little trick that I used to use when developing color palettes for websites. I go to filter, pixelate, mosaic, make the cell size about 150, even bigger maybe, click OK. And that will average out the colors within my color grade inspiration mood board. So then I can use the color dropper and start to pull out color values that I can use for my grade. I might drop these earthy tones into the split toning panel so that the shadows are more tipped towards this color and the highlights tipped towards this color. So what's this, what this is doing is creating a grade based on the heritage of my product. So it will feel correct, it will feel right when it comes to the final grading images. Final page is my biography. So this is just a quick rundown of who I am, who I've worked with. Always include a select client list. It lends a little bit of gravitas to who you are. And also list my agent, my website, my Instagram account. And common courtesy is to say thank you after everything you do. Very British. Uh, clients awarded you the brief. Congratulations. What do you do next? My next step is to create a call sheet and a creative brief from which to work within the field. And I'm going to walk you through an example document from a previous shoot um, so you can get a good idea of what's contained within it. Okay, let's dig into an example call sheet. This is from a real world shoot I did end of last year. You may recognize the brand. Again, for consistency sake, I start with my title slide and just put some ownership on the document. Whereas the treatment was quite high level, just gave me a mood of where I wanted to go. This document is a bit more detailed, a lot more detailed in fact. It contains exa an example of the type of image I'm looking to make. It explains the scenario here. It details, this is for a watch shoot, it even details like the position of the hands on the watch. And if you're ever shooting a watch it should be at 10 past 2, so that displays the logo perfectly without the hand being in the way. And the date window should always be set to 8 because that's nice and symmetrical. I'm also detailing props here to help build out the story, build out the scene. I'm also detailing the call time, so that's the time that I want my model, Jackson, to be on set and the location. Again, picture two, this <laughs> gives examples of the type of image to, I'm looking to make. I'm not looking to copy these images, these are just inspirations. I'm going to put my own spin on it, but this just gives me and my model and also my client an idea of where I'm going to go before I actually shoot it. Again, I'm detailing props and also wardrobe. You know, I'm listing not just specific details here, I'm thinking good textures, leather gloves. You know, I have some yellow biking gloves, might be a bit full on, you know. Again, I'm listing call time and the location. I'm also detailing the type of shot I'm looking to make. So here, as in the theory, as in the shot types episode, I'm actually referencing that here, medium close shot of wrist with watch exposed. It was our good friend, 1924 US, Christian Watson. 
he's actually been the inspiration for a lot of these <laughs> images. Um, again, detailing props, detailing wardrobe, call time, location. Same again. So this shoot comprised of five images that was established in that initial exchange with my client. The deliverables were five images. So these are the five images that I'm going to be making. Here's, here's direction for the, here's some, the scenario digs into the direction I'm going to go with the scene. So Jackson, who is my model, will be guiding a friend to shore with a lantern. It's a twilight scene, so that tells me what time of day I need to be shooting. It also digs into details, like Jackson's going to be holding up the lamp with his left hand. I'm going to be shooting over his shoulder. There's going to be someone else in a canoe on the water in the background, out of focus. I'm really digging into the details here. So when it comes to shoot time, I can concentrate on capturing that image I have in my mind. I'm going to be making this picture, not just taking what's happening in front of me. I'm actually directing right from the outset. And I finish up here with like a an overview of the location where I'm going to be, what time dawn is, what time sunrise is, what time the sun is at its highest, sunset, dusk, and also the weather on this particular day. Saturday will remain cold and sunny with isolated snow showers and wind easing. Wrap up warm. Remember this document's going to my model, it's also going to my client, so everyone is on the same page from the outset. Always finish with a thank you. And that's it for a call sheet. These call sheets can be uh, incredibly complicated and you could go all to town on them. Um, as you can see, there's quite a lot of work, a lot of work actually, in pre-production that I do before shoot day. And all this is time and skill and your creative vision. And this is chargeable time. So you need to account for this time when you're pricing your jobs. So now I want to walk you through one of the key techniques I use on most of my shoots. It's called 50 and stitch. This is not an official name, but it's something I've labeled. Um, I call it 50 and stitch because it's shot with a 50 millimeter lens. This lens is my desert island lens. I have it on my camera most of the time, but it's not very wide. What do I, want to, what do, I do if I want to shoot a wide scene? I stitch together a bunch of different images. The nice thing about a telephoto lens, a 50 millimeter or an 85, you can do this technique with an 85 as well, is it compresses distance. The background of an image comes closer to something in the foreground. If I shoot a scene with a 24 mil lens, it gives me all that space, the wide image, but the background subjects are pushed away from the foreground. What I want to do is bring everything closer, it connects my foreground to my background. Depth perception is exaggerated with a 24mm lens. Telephoto lenses do the opposite. So we're going to take my desert island lens and shoot this technique and I'll walk you through the different processes as I do it. Okay. So I have my focus set on this, this button here, back focus. So what I'm doing is framing my subject in the center, focus, half depress this shutter button, which locks my focus on that vehicle. So then I'll shoot this, adjust the frame, and pick out the rest of the scenes. Slight overlap on each one. Look through the viewfinder when you do this. And then to help the edit, when you import all of these images into Lightroom, if you're doing a few of these successionally, you can, it's hard to tell the difference between one stitch and another. So what I do is I just switch the focus to manual, just put my hand over, shoot. So then I got a cut. I've got a black frame in my Lightroom film strip. Just speeds up editing. Another benefit of this technique is it gives you a massive resolution file. By stitching together eight separate images, you're creating a huge working space. So if you want to shoot a billboard image for a client or something and you can't afford a hassle pad, shoot a 50 and stitch, you'll get the same resolution or same like 
cropping factor. So you can really drill down on an image, pick out details in post. So when you import your card, everything's going to come in sequentially and be ordered according to capture time. So that's one after the other. Straight away, you may have noticed this blank frame here and a hand frame here. So I now know that everything in between these two frames is part of a 50 and stitch. So all I need to do is select them all and hit Control M, which tells Lightroom to create a panoramic image from all of those um, separate frames. Had I not shot these blank frames, I wouldn't know where the stitch started and where it ended. So Lightroom's just done its thing. There are a few projection methods up here. Um, perspective obviously looks horrendous. <laughs> um, it's really distorting everything. Uh, so I think perspective's great for landscape scenes where everything's quite flat, but where we've got a focal point, it's, it's not gonna work for me. So let's try cylindrical. No, it looks much better. I'll try spherical as well, for argument's sake. No, I don't like that. That looks more like a fisheye lens. You can see the distortion in the Land Rover here. So we'll switch back to cylindrical. And we'd hit merge to, to, to instruct Lightroom to merge everything together and create one big file. But rather than doing that again, let's just show you this one, which is one I have done earlier. Um, you can see I've taken out the dog and taken out the people using the clone tool. But you can see here I've got a really massive file, 11,324.90059. And you can see the depth of field at work here. This background's really thrown out of focus in a more dramatic fashion than a 24mm lens. So this is technique number two I want to share with you guys. Uh, it's called a tracking shot or car to car. It's really important for generating a sense of motion for your car. If you stand in the middle of the road and you send it up the road, you're going to get a nice shot, but all the background's going to be still and the car's going to be static too. So to create this image, we need a lead car and our model car. We need both cars moving at the same speed. So the model car stays sharp, but the background is moving. We're sort of cheating in effect in a sense. So in this case, we're using an open top Land Rover. You might not have one of those, but any car will do. Pop the boot and what do you call it in America? Trunk? Pop the trunk. Yeah, I'm British. So I say pop the boot, but you might say trunk. Um, you need to like secure yourself, obviously. Don't fall out of the car. Both cars need to move at the same speed. And a good rule of thumb is to match your shutter speed with the car. So if you're traveling 40 miles an hour, one over 40 a second. Put your camera into shutter priority mode so you can set the shutter speed and the camera will look after your aperture settings. I find it easier to work with walkie talkies. So I'm in the front car, my driver in my model car, we can communicate. There's no, we don't have to be doing like this or like this. I can just literally say to him, ease off the pedal 10 miles an hour faster, eases the communication. I'm using this technique to generate a sense of movement. Remember, we're moving workshop to beach using the car. I don't want it to look crazy blurred. This is not a Ferrari, it's a Land Rover, but I still want that sense of movement. I want the vehicle to be traveling through the landscape, that feeling of passing by something. So lens choices, I'd go wide. The longer your lens, the more shake you're gonna get. And when you're in the back of a car, trust me, you shake. When you're in the back of a Land Rover on a dusty road, you shake a lot. Um, so as wide as possible, 24 mil, mm, pushing it, you could go with a 35, but um, nothing longer than that. I don't think it will work. You'll have to ramp your shutter speed up too far and you won't get that blur. Everything will be sharp. Today's very bright. We're shooting in the middle of the day. Um, and because I've slowed my shutter speed down, I'm letting a lot of light into my lens. So I've put an ND filter on to cheat 
the lens to close it down so I can drag the shutter and not overexpose the image. There's no rule of thumb when it comes to settings. It's a bit hit and hope, but my, I'm gonna start with one over 50th shutter priority mode, ND filter, close down the lens, and the camera will decide the aperture. It's probably gonna hit like F22 or something in daylight like this. There's no shortcuts to this technique. Practice, like everything. Just put it onto rapid fire mode, shoot a whole bunch, review. If it doesn't work, try again. So I'm now in the back of the Land Rover. I need to keep myself pretty steady. And we're gonna try and shoot this. Whoa, this is hell, hellish bumpy. Shit, I would be amazed if we got a sharp photo. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go. It's very bumpy, so I'm gonna have to really rack up my shutter speed. The trick with this shot is to go as slow as possible, but these vehicles are not smooth and this road is not smooth. So, too much camera shake, blurred shots. I'll try it again. Okay, let's speed up a bit. Speed up. Yeah, let's get on this flat road. Oh. Okay. Just adjusting my exposure. I've got to boost my shutter speed. But because of the ND and I'm working quickly, I'm ramping my ISO instead of messing with that setting. And review. So bumpy. I think we got some sharp shots in here though. Increasing my shutter speed. Trying to get closer to the ground because closer I am to something as it's moving past me is going to get that sense of movement. It's going to blur it. All right. That's a wrap. <laughs> That's cool. Oh no. Okay, so I'm just reviewing some shots from the tracking sequence. It's quite hard to tell in this light, but from what I can see, I've got like four or five clean shots, background blurred. It's all about practice. This technique is actually good fun, <laughs> sitting in the back of a car, communicating with two drivers. Try it for yourself. Practice makes perfect. Go out there, do it. This is where the magic happens. This is where we pull everything together, shot over the last few days, and begin to craft a story out of it. I love this part of my job. I love shooting, being out in the wilds, but I also really enjoy coming back to base, sticking some headphones on, and starting to work with everything we captured. Okay, before we can do anything with our images, we've got to get them off our camera and into our computer. So I'm going to walk you through my process I use for importing images from my card into Lightroom and the selection process that I make. Let's get on with it. Okay, so before I do anything, I have one main folder called import, which is on my desktop. Within this, I will then create a parent folder for the shoot. So I have a naming convention for this. It starts with work or personal. Only two differentiators. If it's work, it begins with work. If it's personal, a personal shoot, it begins with personal. So work dash date of shoot, year and month. So 2018 September, followed by client, followed by the assignment, so in this case that will be workshop. Within that, we create four or sometimes five other folders, beginning with catalog. So this houses my Lightroom catalog. Capture. This houses all of my raw files. 2500px. This houses any JPEGs outputted at that size. 
and one more is 4000. Similarly, any JPEGs outputted at 4000 px just keeps things in order. Sometimes, if I've got drone footage, keep it in caps, I'll create another folder for all my drone files. Okay, so yeah, that's the folder structure. I've already done this here. So this is my demo that I'm going to show you. So here's my Lightroom catalog within the catalog folder. I'll open that up and we'll run through quickly my star rating system for making selects. No surprises here. I use one to three stars to filter my catalog to make my selects. It's a very quick process, the first pass. I'm really um, just going on composition and how I'm feeling about the image. It's a really wide edit. Just giving anything that I feel I like the look of one star. I rarely delete images. Often I'll come back to stuff. I might come back through the catalogue again at a later date and see something that I might have missed. So you can see I've actually graded, not graded, um, rated quite a lot of these already. Okay, so once I've gone through the catalogue and rated everything I deem worthy of one star, I can filter. 2,799 photos, my entire shoot, down to the 633 that I want to take a closer look at. Um, at this point, I'll introduce my color labeling system. I use color labels to filter all of these one star photos into specific shot types. So, Red, yellow, green, blue. Red, six, denotes a cutaway. Seven, yellow, denotes a close-up shot. Eight, green, denotes a medium close or a medium shot. And nine is a long shot, such as this, where the environment is dominating my character. So I just run through the catalog. This is a nine. This is an extreme or long shot. Again, this is nine. As before, I've done this on quite a lot of photos already. You can see along the bottom. This is an eight. That's a medium shot coming in into our subject, but the environment is still dominating our character. This is a six, a cutaway. This is a seven, a yellow, a close-up. I think you're going to get the idea here. Back to nine. Mm, actually, I give that a, a uh, an eight. A green it's medium the environment isn't dominating there. I'd say subject is six. Cut away. Eight. Medium. Long. To blue. Six. Cut away. Six, cut away. Six, cut away. Six, cut away. See, it's really simple, very quick. Six, cut away. So once you've done this, this is all of my images. This is all of my images rated at one star. Yep. Uh, so what are we working with here? 635 for 2,805 photographs. If I now click the red filter, show photos with red label, that's going to show me all of my cutaways. So I'm down to 103. So when I'm building my story, if I need a cutaway scene, I can just filter the entire catalogue based on that type of shot. Similarly, with a close-up, by hitting the yellow label, Show photos with yellow label. It's going to show me all of my close-ups. Similarly, with medium shots. And again, with long or extreme long shots. All of my blue images, 262 of these. 
it just makes retrieval of images so much quicker. Rather than sifting through, what would this be without this system? 635 photographs, all of a mix. I can drill down really, really quickly into the type of image that I need. One more thing I tend to do if it's a multi-day shoot is create collections based on location. So as you can see here, day one was the board shaping shoot. Day two was the road trip that we did using the Land Rover. And day three was the surfing section of the shoot. Again, it's using this system or process can seem a little laborious to begin with. But when you're working with a lot of images and you want to retrieve things quickly, I tell you, it's invaluable in terms of time saving, especially if you're coming in back to a shoot or coming back to a catalogue you know, months after you've finished and submitted the files. Often clients or um, magazines will be interested in a particular image that they've seen from the shoot and they want to buy it. Having this system in place allows me to open up the catalogue months after a shoot's finished and retrieve images very, very quickly. All of this is time saving. Time is money when you're a photographer. So having a system in place to make your selects and retrieve images quickly saves you money. So I'd really, really recommend it. Now comes the edit. This is where everything comes together, where we use a combination of different shot types and working as a whole to tell our story. From the outset, we knew where we were gonna go with the story. We had a plot. We had a location, we had a character, and from a combination of those two things, we could create our event. Our character, our surfer, whose ultimate desire is to reach the perfect surf spot, to find the perfect beach. <clears throat> the location is obviously Portugal, and the obstacle to him reaching it is. Let's say his work, he's got to work to live, and also accessibility. And that's where we can bring our client in, which is our Land Rover. So from that, we can create our structure, our beginning, middle, end. Beginning point is our surfer's place of work. Our middle is the transition from his work to our end point, which is the beach, the sunset scenes. So. I think the best way to illustrate this is to show you and to walk you through the essay as it stands on my website. Here it is. I'll walk you through each and every image and the reasons why I've chosen it. Opening scene, Dan in his board shaping room. So this introduces our character and also the lifestyle that he's associated with, which is Mm, I was going to say obviously surfing, but maybe not obvious straight away. But there are clues to his lifestyle here. We're not giving everything away straight away. It's just not a straight shot of him walking down a beach. I need to build up to that. And so we start in his board shaping room, artificially lit. His place of work. Move deeper into his character or his process hand shaping. He's a master at this, by the way. He makes some of the best surfboards, best longboards, some of the world's best surfers. Um, real privilege to shoot him doing what he does. Um, I love this shot. This is a hand-built tool that he, he made. And I love this sort of pile of offcuts in the corner. So I introduce this pile of offcuts here, and this is where it comes from him breaking off the sawn off bits over his knee. I like the fact that he's barefoot here as well, which is an interesting observation to me. I wanted to illustrate it in the set. 
Okay, now we're moving away from the hand processes into the more industrial processes or power tools. From sanding, love this image. I could have begun with this image, you know, but I feel it's very powerful. It doesn't really tell me much. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on. Whereas this one, it's shot from the other angle. It's just more going on. Just orientates the audience from the outset. Gives them a clue as to what's going on. Doesn't reveal everything, but but since we're already in this room, we can we understand what's going on here. Um, more detail, more intimacy. Moving into the resin room, uh, we were really pushed for time at this point, um, but I insisted we shot it because I think this is a really nice connecting sequence between the interior, the dark interiors, artificially lit interiors, and the naturally lit exteriors. This room's naturally lit, so we're using light and colour to move into the exterior sequences. But this process of resin, applying resin to the board, is related to this process. So it's just a nice sequence that connects inside to outside. Here we're introducing our client, our Land Rover. Quite clear, I think. I asked to shoot this sequence with Dan, moving his board from his shop to the Land Rover, and Land Rover then takes him to the beach couple of interior images, puts the audience inside the car, adds a sense of urgency, I think, this sequence. He's driving, he's looking, reaches a spot. Uh, again, I asked to shoot this sequence with Dan. I directed this. I was like, right, can you look at your watch? And then turn back to the car. Idea being that mm, he likes this bar, but it's not perfect. Checks his watch, what time sunset. Just jump in the car. Again, creating a sense of urgency using this tracking shot. You can see this motion blur, so he's moving quickly. I want to emphasize this sense of urgency, and I've done that by dropping this into black and white, which might seem a funny thing to do with this sequence of color images, but it really pops that image out. You notice it. The audience subliminally notices it and reinforces this sense of urgency or time or travel or moving. Drone sequences introduces the landscape as a whole and connects our Land Rover to the ocean. End sequence here, leading with the setting sun and the ocean. This is where he's going to end up. He's going to be surfing this. He's not there yet. He's got a few more processes to do and for me to shoot. But these, these scenes are really, really beautifully lit by setting sun could have started here but I liked I wanted to show the light source for these images before I dug into them as it were I like this um, scene this is actually a 15 stitched image so you can see it's a really wide image but I've got this amazing depth of field which would have been impossible to get with a wide angle lens shoot it with a 50 in you know, really shallow depth of field, stitch it all together and you get that nice popping character out of the background. Um, but I also like his pose here. He's looking out towards the sun. He feels urgent again. Got to get on with it. That's his obstacle to his desire for sun setting. Um, sequence shot from inside the Land Rover. He's still waxing his board. But by pairing it with this exterior shot, you know, reinforcing where this has been shot from, and then connecting this sequence to him reaching the ocean. Remember to shoot these, these, these connecting sequences, join the dots between scenes. You might just, it's not an amazing shot on its own, but it works really nicely connecting this scene to here. Could have just gone straight from here to here, but this is telling a story, remember. We're not thinking just individual shots. Um, okay, so he's pulling his wetsuit on, walking down the beach, paddling out. Two uh, separate shots, but when set together, they work nicely. Again, telling the story, but make sure this horizontal horizon line is level. 
so they work nicely together. I think the actual captures are uneven and so I've cropped in to ensure that they're level. There's a little trick within Lightroom I can show you in a minute, uh, show you how to ease that process. Waiting for his perfect wave, another set of two images that work quite nicely together. These could look like one image in a sense, and I've just split it down the middle, but this little boat on the horizon shows you it's actually two. Dan's actually hidden behind this big wave here in this sequence. I kind of I did, but I really like the way they work together. This wave almost continues across, even though it's the same wave. It feels like one whole. Just just makes you look at it twice. Uh, again, waiting and jumps up on his board and he's surfing to finish. Just a little note about this end scene which I've left in to give you an example of where the role of editor comes in. I really like it. It's a great shot, loads of atmosphere, and it rounds off a set really nicely, but I'm not sure it works in this instance. <clears throat> I can't connect this colorway to this night scene without some intermediary imagery. There's too much of a jump between the two, in my mind. And so I'm not sure it's going to make the cut. This is where your editor brain needs to come in. Does it work with the entire set? I'm not sure in this instance. So I'll probably cut it, maybe use it on Instagram. It'll work really nicely on Instagram. I think people are really engaged with it and use it to promote the series. You know, I can write, tell a story about this scene in a caption, end of an amazing day. Um, go and have a look at my website to view the full set. I guess I'm hoping to see you guys tell better stories with your photographs. Whether that's in like fancy locations halfway around the world or in your own backyard. I also want to see you make images that mean something to you because if they mean something to you, they're going to mean something to your audience. I'd also like to see you make the images you have in your own mind, not those same old cliched shots. I know you can do it and I'm pretty confident the steps I've laid out in this workshop will help you do this. Make, don't take is my mantra. I really hope it will become yours as well. Thanks for listening. <laughs>